Got 20 seconds. I'm on a man to go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Drive forward. Let's go. One more. Up. You are listening to the Fight Strength Podcast with your hosts, Phil DeRue and Jason Burgos. What is going on, my fighting and fitness fans? Episode 32 of the Fight Strength Podcast is here. And as always, coming straight to your ear holes is myself, Jason Burgos, contributor to MMASucker.com and soon to be SureDog.com. And of course, my co host, the globe trotting, fight, fighter building, bodybuilding, UFC countdown appearing, strength and conditioning mastermind of American Tom Team. You know the name, and that is Phil Drew. Phil, you've been busy with some UFC countdown crew filming of late, I see. Yeah, man. So. Don't once this airs, just like mind my voice because I literally had about one hour of sleep before we did that shot, Ooh. and uh, and I was there from like nine a.m. and then we started shooting around like six, so that was my life, you know. Wow. And that was like after I ran like four groups of uh, of fighters and then did some privates and things like that. So it was a fun time. Let me just put it like that. It was a fun time, like always with the with the crew at the UFC. But uh, we got to showcase some good stuff. We got to showcase a lot of Nick stuff from Mind Body yeah, One. Yeah, saw that. Good for him, man. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's doing really well, man. He's going to be working with the uh, – I think he's working with the U.S. soccer team coming up too, man. Oh, nice. So he, he's killing the game. I'm, I'm very happy for him. Um, you know, and he's and we're going to showcase a lot more than what we did before on the last um, countdown. Well, now I think this is Road, the o- Road to the Octagon, so it's a little different because it's a Fox special. Okay. So now we went from, you know, Fox Sports 1 or, or you know, FS1 to Fox entirely, which nice. is good. So, yeah, he's, he got it out there. And the Fit Light guys, the company itself that we use for the lights, they actually got him. They're trying to um, to put him on, on payroll, so that's good too. Oh, man. Um, uh, when is uh, do you know when that's gonna air? Since it's gonna be on the, uh, the Fox it'll main probably, channel, it'll probably be on that Sunday before the fight for mm-hmm. Dustin. So whatever the week that Sunday is on before the fourteenth, I don't know what that day is. So how does it usually work? Like, do like, they do they like wait till the gym is kind of cleared out? Do they they film while everybody that. else is working? Like how does that all happen? No, we had kids going on. It was like kids <laughs> classes. <laughs> there was jujitsu class going on. Everything. So it's not it's not like a closed setting. Like they kind of just get, you know, real, real time kind of gives us a glimpse or gives them people a glimpse of what we do, a small glimpse like I put on my post in Instagram. It's a very small glimpse of what we do, you know, from a physical preparation standpoint and from his whole entire life in fight camp. Like they get small little tidbits here and there, but it's it's like a very small glimpse of what he really goes through. But it is something that, that ex- excites the fans and it gets everybody ready for the fight itself. And uh, I'm excited to see, you know, what all of our hard work has paid off for once we, you know, get our hand raised after, you know, Justin. And and, and to be honest, man, DP's on another level to be like from what I'm seeing now, I'm watching him spar, watching him move. I feel like he's um he's coming. He's definitely in his prime right now. He's peaking to be one of the best ever. So and that's just not that's not me blowing his head up or, or you know, talking because I'm the coach or whatever. Mm-hmm. I truly see that from from out the even if I look from the outside in, I would be like, damn, he's really uh, coming into his own. So it's good, good to see. As long as we keep our composure and uh, keep everything you know steady and not go crazy and do the old Dustin Poirier, where just trying to knock somebody's heads off and <laughs> and go crazy, uh, it will be good. We'll be we'll be good to go. So, but it's an exciting time, and you want us fighting a week before that. You know, we just had. Um, I just had two fighters, Mariusz and uh, Scott Askham, fight for KSW. They mm-hmm. both won, mm-hmm. both won titles, so that's good. Or, nice. or Mariusz, you know, defended his title and Scott won a title, so it's, it's good, man. Good, uh, good week so far. Also, you know, Andre Olaski won. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a good look. We're we're doing pretty well. 
All right, so I mean, people, listen, keep keep look out for it. Fox is coming up this week. You know, you get to see Phil. You get to see former guest Nicholas Davenport, former guest Dustin Poirier before the, the, the lead up to the fight. So go look for that. But I mean, on today's show, we are very lucky to have on one of the truly elite coaches in the MMA game, and that is nutrition and weight cutting guru to the stars, George Lockhart. Uh, Phil, you know, tell us a little bit about how you know you you came into contact with George, how how you met him, how you end up getting on the show. It's a little background on what you know about him. Uh, several ways, man. I, I've um, I've known about George for quite a while now. Um, him working with, uh, I mean, he's worked with everybody pretty much at this point. But you know, he started working with Dustin Poirier a while back, and at the same time, obviously, I was working with him. I met him in Dallas when he uh, fought Eddie Alvarez, and uh, got to talking to him. You know, and and I seen that he and he knew what he was talking about. Like he he's a guy that like. Like we've talked about before, he knows what he knows and he's not going to tell you what he doesn't like. He's not going to go into detail of what he doesn't know. He's going to just, you know, state what he knows and and he's very knowledgeable in what he does know. So, I mean, he goes the extra mile and he does his thing. And the good thing about it, he doesn't he's not a guy that wants to get it all in the spotlight. Like we like we'll see, you know, he goes to the weigh ins and then once the weigh ins are over, he's out of there. He doesn't even go to the fight. So it's it's a good thing um, for the sport. To have such individuals like that, like a Tony Ricci, yeah. you know, like a Chris Algieri, Dan Garner, these guys are all looking to better performance through nutritional means. And me being a strength and conditioning coach, a physical preparation specialist, whatever you want to call it, having a guy like that on your team is good to have because we can converse and we we respect each other. At the same time, we understand each other's roles. So nobody's stepping on each other's toes. Nobody's trying to do, you know, do other, you know, do what they're not called to do, you know. And and now working together with uh, Yoana Young Jacek for her next fight, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great relationship that we have just because that mutual respect. Mm. And he understands what I'm trying to do, and I understand what he's trying to do, and we can relay this over to Joanna when she's, you know, a little bit apprehensive or not knowing because of the fact that she's been working with, you know, let's say not so knowledgeable people in the past. <laughs> understatement. <laughs> understatement. But you know, at the same time, now she's she's um, she's beginning to understand the processes here, and and really um, accept it, and that's a good thing. So. I'm excited and we'll probably be working more and more in the future with other fighters in general at American Top Team. So it's good. I mean, I, that's what I dig about the the strength coaches in the industry because it's not like, you know, you guys are all working kind of under the same like, uh, you know, tools and similar tools and ideas, but you use it and, and, and apply it in your own way. So, but there's not this like... Uh, Oh, this is my fighter. These are my guys. Over loyalty, like you guys respect each other. You're willing to work with each other, help each other out. If you have five guys fighting each other, it's not a problem. You you know understand the competition and professionalism. You I don't feel like there's that same kind of feel between you know other coaches and you know other parts of the game and other teams. Like I, I dig that about the strength coaches. There's far less ego it seems like than other coaches. Yeah, I mean, the fighters are the ones stepping in the cage to do the work. Mm -hmm. We're just there to help them and guide them and, you know, coach them up. You know, at the same time, I work for American Top Team. I'm an American Top Team coach. So for me to say that's my fighter, it's not my fighter. That's American Top Team fighter. Mm -hmm. I'm just a coach there that helps him along and gets him better in my, you know, specialized field, which is physical preparation. So I stay in my lane. I make sure that I do what I need to do to get these guys and girls ready. And they are a part of a team, and this is not my team. I am a part of the team, so mm. it can't be one man show type deal. And you also have to remember that it's on them at the end of the day. People are going to see them on TV. People are going to see them with their hand raised or with their hand not raised. So, you know, for you, you can give them the blueprint. They just have to go ahead and follow it. And from there, that's when you could create the relationship. The same thing goes with every other coach. They got to understand that they're not bigger than the process. The process is what it is. You can't change that. You know, you're not you're not bigger than the team and the team is all in one. So if, when coaches can understand that and really work cohesively with each other, that's when you're going to see a overall performance increase in your fighters capabilities and it's in, in their career. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I, it's awesome. And that's what I appreciate about, you know, co-hosting with you, meeting these guys and, and seeing 
you know, the attitudes and style and the personalities and just the, the reputation of really respected guys. I dig it. But I mean, of course, I would be remiss in not mentioning you can check out all of our previous episodes with other strength coaches and nutrition experts like Nicholas Davenport, Dr. Court Peacock, Joe DeFranco, uh, Chris Algieri, and our main man, Tony Ricci, by finding our pages on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Player FM, and Google Play Music. Now on to our weekly Ask the Roof segment, which is brought to you by the Daru Strong Training Systems. Um, the question is, I'm asking it today, and it's pretty much, well, you know, so Phil, you have your own gym that you base your work with your own clients out of, I mean, along with your well-known work at American Top Team. Uh, for the trainers out there coming up and maybe just graduating school again early in the game in the industry, who would like to own their own facility one day? What was the process you went through to put together getting your own place? I mean, what's the nitty gritty details? You know, did you do a lot of research to find your facility? What sort mm -hmm. of building are there specific buildings you want to go for instead of other ones? Is is there a minimum space in terms of square footage wise, you know, that mm -hmm. a guy needs? You know, all that kind of key stuff for a person that may want to invest in getting their own facility and space to work out of. Yeah. Well, first we have to figure out what's your demographic. What are you, what are you looking to do? What are you looking, who are you look? who are you looking to work with? And then you can correlate, you know, your specific means from there. I would say that if you're trying to be a strength and conditioning coach in general, and just try to work with general population, high school, college athletes, find yourself a warehouse facility that you can have a low overhead for. And when you start out, make sure that you're not going super big. A lot of the times, especially me, my mistake was that I grew too fast and I ended up opening up a mega facility before I was actually ready to do so. Mm -hmm. This is coming from a kid that never really had a business background, all science based, and I ended up being in charge of an 11,000 square foot facility wow. where I had over 500 members and I didn't even know how to run QuickBooks. <laughs> so this is this is what my dilemma was, right? Yeah. Luckily, I had people around me that were able to help me with this process going further. But I could have eliminated that if I would have just stayed in my lane and learned slowly, right? Progressed more, I should say, adequately instead of just rapidly growing faster and faster. Now, that can be, you know, a good thing and a bad thing, right? Just got to know your demographic. You got to know where you want to go. What's your vision of your particular gym or business model? And then from there, you can grow from, you know, you can set little goals and grow. But like I said, if you're looking to start up a business, first of all, I would get real world experience. If you're just coming out of college or you're just coming out of school or just got a certification, you don't have the real world application and the experience to actually run a facility. I would get with a respectable coach or get with a respectable gym and do an internship or even maybe do some independent contracting training out of that gym. Understand the process that they go through, learn from their, you know, learn from what they do good and what they do wrong. And then from there, you could correlate what you want to do. But I would I would definitely wait at least two to three years before you ever start thinking about owning your own facility after you get out of college or get a certification or whatever the case may be. Then from there, that's when you can start up a smaller type facility, something that's not going to be crazy overhead that where you're basically not going to make any type of money or you're going to be losing money within the first two or three years. Mm -hmm. Now, once you start a business, everybody knows the first five years, you're not going to make an income. You're not going to, well, you're not going to make a established income. Yeah. It's not going to be something that you're going to be rich off of. You're actually probably going to take a hit. That's okay as long as you know that you have things in place. Now, I would definitely have some other means of income before you go about having this business. You don't only want this to be your only source of income because you're going to not have a car or a house to live in. So make sure that you have something on the side that you can actually you know, help with the business yeah, and that could yeah. be anything that could be you know if you're if you're a bigger guy once you just go ahead and you know do some um you know security or whatever the case may be bartending i don't know whatever it is just do something on the side that you can actually have some type of uh some income so it can help you with your training from there once you once you start to establish yourself as a as an influence in your neighborhood in your community whatever the case that's when you can start go ahead and putting your sole focus only into the gym just because you have the abilities to do so. Now, I'm not saying that don't be fully focused on your business and your gym. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you, you might want to have a buffer 
to start off with. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. With that being said, you definitely want to make sure that you're giving your 100% into your business because at the end of the day, you know, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a gym owner, whatever you want to call it, your job does not stop from nine to five. It's constant. It's 24, seven, 365. And, and I can, and, and Jason, you can attest to this, you know, that I'm always working. Yep. So there's not a time where I'm actually, you know, shutting it down. You know, there's other ways after you're done training clients, you got to worry about marketing. You got to worry about getting more people in. You got to worry about advertisements. You got to worry about setting up programs. You got to worry about bringing in more people. You got to worry about bringing in trainers that can help you establish your, your dominance, things like that. Now that's going to be an, a, a constant, constant grind. So be aware and be ready for that. And then once you are, and once you un understand that process, then you can go all in, but just understand first, that it's not going to be easy for the first five to even 10 years. Wow. And I'm serious about this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Joe DeFranco says this a lot where the first 10 years he was in business, nobody knew who he was. And then he's all of a sudden he blew up. Same thing here. I started an American top team, but people don't know that I've been doing this since I was 19 years old. And just so happens when I was 27, I got the, the job opportunity to go work with such high level fighters. But they weren't with me when I was working with, you know, Cindy, who's a soccer mom and, and has three kids and just wants to get in shape and mm -hmm. lose a little bit of belly fat. You know, not saying there's nothing wrong with training these people. But what I'm saying is that I've been doing this for a long fucking time. Yeah. You know, and I'm not some quote unquote overnight nice. success. Mm. So. I mean, I'm glad you brought up too, because this is an interesting question. You, you mentioned internships for, I know you had a, a you have them from time to time. For someone that lives in the Florida region, you know, is a big fan of your work, you know, wants to learn from someone you like you, are there internship opportunities to work with you and how would a person go about doing that? Yeah, so I had several, um, I mean, I get DMs like this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we do have internship opportunities, one in my private facility and also at American Top Team. Right now, we're currently not... Um, able to take any any um, inquiries so far just because we already have one filled up but every uh, every every quarter we we always uh, look into getting another intern so if you want to if you're interested you can email me phil at derushon.com and we can get that thing started um, I would also need a resume and I'll need a, a, a proof of education so just go ahead and let me know that and then after that once I see the resume we'll do a quick phone call introduction consultation interview and then uh we either fly you out or you could drive down to american top team or to my private facility either way and uh we'll go from there we need to have like the little drop was like a, a boom which is a knowledge bomb it's just drop right now on people i mean just uh, we just need that right now we do this week we are lucky to have on one of the premier nutrition and weight cutting specialists in the game today he has worked with superstar fighters and champions like Rory McDonald, Dustin Poirier, John Jones, Conor McGregor, and then this weekend he Chris Cyborg. I mean, you might as well call him the the dietitian of champions, honestly. He's a former MMA fighter, Marine, and the man behind the highly regarded site Fitness VT. He is George Lockhart, and we are very lucky to have him on this week. George, thank you so much for coming on the show. Man, thanks for having me, boss. All right, George. So, for the people that don't know about you, which is pretty seldom, can you uh, give the people a bit of your background and how you got started cutting weight for these high level fighters and how you got started in MMA in general? Yeah, man. It, it was funny, man. I started fighting really young, and uh, I, you know, I turned pro when I was eighteen. And uh, man, I didn't know anything about uh, you know cutting weight, and <laughs> I just knew I knew how to do it wrong because. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my first couple of weight cuts were god awful, man. And I think I think half of the things I've learned is what not to do. Um, became, you know, I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, I actually became a you know combat conditioning specialist in the Marine Corps, which actually you know converts very well for MMA because you know we have weight standards, we have performance standards, um, <clears throat> and then later on, you know, we had to learn about like hydration and things like that, which really you know came uh, came, um, helpful during the IV band. But, um, you know, just like MMA, you know, you have to make weight. But if you make weight and you can't perform, it doesn't really help you out a whole lot. So it kind of 
I just had a kind of transition, and I was in uh, I was in the Marine Corps with a guy, you know, Brian Stan. I, you know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people know who he was, and he uh, he did well in WC. He did real well in WC, and then you know, we all know that the UFC bought him out, and then he went from the WC to the UFC at 205, and we used to make jokes about him. You know, he get the he get the big head and his little arms, you know, and, and uh, mm-hmm. he just ain't got no reach at 205. So. Mm-hmm. I'm like, bro, you need to 185, and he didn't know if he could do it. So anyway, long story short, I got him 185. He introduced me. He's like, hey, you know, the second cut, he's like, you know, I want you to help out this guy in my camp. And mm-hmm. he went and uh, introduced me to John Jones, and then it just kind of trickled down from there, you know. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so it's for the, I mean, we have a lot of fight fans, and we also have a lot of fighters that listen to the podcast. Now, with your initial consultation, what markers are you looking for and what information do you usually collect before working with, you know, a particular fighter? Yeah, you know, the big big ones are like, you know, obviously, <laughs> where's your weight at right now? Mm-hmm. So where are you at? Where are you going? Um, I like to check out like body fat percentage. Um, <clears throat> kind of see the build of an individual, you know what I mean? Because there's certain things like you get down weight and uh, your muscle is actually really beneficial we uh we worked with drew dober a couple of months ago man a kid uh he showed up uh to the ufc check-ins at 185 and you know had to make 155 so tuesday 185 and then friday weighed 155 and felt great yeah. um and the thing about it is man he's got so much dang muscle that you know muscle 70 percent water if you know how to extract it and do it correctly then you know the cut shouldn't be an issue but mm-hmm. uh, if you have somebody that's kind of, you know, kind of, no, nah, I wouldn't say overweight. You're not going to have a UFC fighter that's overweight. But you have somebody that, you know, is carrying a little bit more body fat than muscle. Then, you know, your body fat is, you know, fat hydrophobic. It doesn't attach to water. Mm-hmm. So we can't really draw from that. So that's, that's a big one. Kind of seeing where the frame is, activity level, where you're at, where you're going. And then, um, you know, basically you know, your habits, you know what I mean? So yeah, as you've seen on the online program, it, it's kind of a, a thing where I just got to trust the fighter because you got that human factor. If they're not doing what the program says, you know, they're not going to not show up all uh, the week of the fight. Um, you know what I mean? I'm going to have my work cut out for me, but if they follow yeah. the program to the T, then it's the easy day. Yeah, for sure. That, that That's usually how it is, man. And a lot of the fighters, they don't understand it, and they and they they want to kind of go on their own or do what they used to do or what worked for them in the past, and they don't know that you know they're progressing in their in their entire in their future as far as their career goes, but also their body's changing, and then that's where you got to get somebody like a George Lockhart to help you with these um these certain types of, of weight cuts, man. Because if you don't, if you don't have a professional looking over the the whole factor of it, you're worrying about your training. You're not worrying really about what you're putting into your body, which you actually should. But at the same time, you know your primary source is just to train and to get better. And this is why you know hiring somebody like a George Lockhart would be beneficial to any fighter in general trying to make it to the next level. So I do commend you on that, brother. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and it's, I always tell people, you don't know what you don't know, you know, and it, it's funny because um, a lot of guys are like, and you, like you said, I could do this on my own. And one thing I always say is, like, you know, your body's like a car. You know, these guys are UFC fighters, but, you know, they're like a Lamborghini, but it's like putting, you know, bad bad fuel into an amazing vehicle if you don't you know if you don't know what to do and you know when to do it you buy you get a mechanic you know you're not going to work on a lambo yourself yeah. you're not going to try and figure it out on your own you know what i'm saying so yeah, for sure. <laughs> As I mentioned in the intro, you have worked with a who's who's list of fighters in your career. Since you were well established in the sport, are you very selective with who you work with? I mean, if you are, what is the process you undertake before you take on a new fighter? You know, honestly, my my goal is to get the entire UFC. You know, ah. um, yeah, we uh, you know, I got a <laughs> it's a small goal, but <laughs> <laughs> no, we yeah. um. You know, we, we have a team of guys now, you know what I mean? And and, and I hate to say this, but, like, you know, you, you're right. We have, you know, we we were working with uh, Luke Rockhold. We're in talks with, uh, you know, Robert Whitaker's uh, oh, crew. Nice. And, you know, you're looking at the you got the 185ers, you know, got, you know the 170ers. Obviously, uh, you know, we work with just about everybody in the 155. And, and, and I'm, I'm wow. you know, I'm, I'm glad to work with the champions. I'm glad to work with – but the thing is, it's like it's – the up and comers, you know what I mean? Like we just got done with this this uh this camp. We had Frank Yeager on this card, you know, and, wow. and, and Frankie doesn't have huge cuts, but the guy 
he stays ahead of the game. You know what I mean? Like, hey, you know what? I I don't I don't have a rough cup. I want to make sure that everything is perfect. And um, you know, he he can afford that, and these guys that are more established can afford it. What I want to do is I want to help the guys that are just getting into the sport. You know what I mean? The guys that are making ten and ten. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create um, a business model where we're able to basically kind of disperse funds uh, amongst a, a, a large group of fighters. So if we get like, you know, 15 fighters on a card, um, we can kind of disperse those funds, you know. And, and obviously the guys that are paying more are going to be with me uh, a little bit more. I'll be with them a little bit more. Some guys pay for exclusivity and things like that, but the team is going to be there. So these guys don't have to worry about nothing to make sure they have a safe weight cut. Nice, man. That's good. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the UFC because, I mean, it transitions easy to the next question. I mean, since, you know, you have such an esteemed reputation, do you get a lot of referrals by way of the UFC brass themselves? Like, they contact you, say, hey, look, George, so-and-so, Miss Way, we're worried about this guy or girl doing this too much. Please help us out. Work with this person. Be the nutrition. Is that Do you get a lot of stuff just directly from them? No, you know, used to, like, you know, we got a couple calls, uh, you know, uh, back in the day but not anymore you know they just they just contact me and they're like hey we we, we heard you're working with so-and-so um you just you know just checking in on them making sure that the weight's okay you know jeff Davinsky, me and him uh, we work very good you know very well together uh he knows who i'm working with a lot of the time and he's just like hey man you know he weighed you know, this guy weighed in super heavy like uh james vick um yeah, we worked with him boy. in the austin card <laughs> <laughs> he's a big boy yeah. <laughs> he likes to make me work <laughs> but you know me, me and james are good friends but you know you know jeff's like hey man you know uh your boy he, he went a little heavy and you know he just makes sure that you just me and him are always communicating during the week of the fight so uh to answer your question no they don't they don't uh do that anymore but you know word of mouth from the fighters is, is definitely uh picked up so i'm good to go with that Nice, man. So let me just uh, retract here and, and see. I wanted to ask you generally, I like. I basically want to talk to you about your intra-workout and post-workout protocols for performance and recovery. Now, are there differences depending on the modalities and the intensities of the training? And to give us some details on how you go about formulating this as it goes on in fight camp. Right, right. Yeah. So, so again, it comes down to you know, the program that, that I have. Um, when I do these seminars, basically, you know, it's, it's, it's all math, you know, and at the end of the seminar, I'm like, you know, you can, you can do the math yourself or you can just use this program, you know, it's super simple, yes. but, um, what we use is, you know, obviously you get the metabolic equivalent to find out the actual calories that an individual, um, is burning. Okay. So, you know, if you look at the, the formula for the metabolic equivalent, you're going to get the amount of calories, but here's the thing. Me and you both know that if I jog and I burn a thousand calories or if I lift and I burn a thousand calories, you burn a thousand calories for both, but you, you use different fuel. And this is what a lot of fighters don't understand is that, yeah. that, you know, not only do you have to fuel yourself with the right amount, but you also have to fuel yourself correctly. And it's like a lot of times I tell people, it's like, putting gas in your oil pan and putting oil in your gas tank, you know, it doesn't work. So yeah. when somebody's more anaerobic, um, we, we obviously increase the amount of carbohydrates. So for instance, let's say you're at a level 10, right? A level 10 would be in, in the people. It's funny because when we say a level 10, I'm talking about how anaerobic you are. You know, if I hate running, you know, people put that as a 10 because they hate it. They're like, I hate running. So that's an <laughs> intensity of 10, you know, but you know, they just went out and jogged three miles. You know, it's uh, you, you're not going to be, an, you know, anaerobic for three miles. It just can't be without oxygen for that long. So, mm -hmm. with that being said, I think, uh, you know, I, when when I break things down into numbers, people are like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. But so, so here's the thing. So, you know, if you're anaerobic, your body's burning more carbohydrates. If you're aerobic, your body's burning more fat. Mm -hmm. So I ask people, I'm like, you think you can burn 800 calories in a workout? They're like, well, yeah, like, yeah, absolutely, man. Especially at the level these guys are at, 800 calories is nothing. So if your body's anaerobic, you burn 800 calories, that means that you need basically 200 grams of carbohydrates just to refuel what you just did. And I'm like, you know, how many times have you guys intake, you know, 100 grams of carbs post-workout? A lot of these guys are like, you know, like I, uh, <laughs> I took a banana post-workout, you know, and, and one of the big things is, Everything we talk about is is all about hormonal response, to, you know. Um, and when I when I ingest, you know, protein, it releases glucagon. So I want I want 
I want glucagon before I work out. Glucagon tells my body to use free fatty acids and store glycogen. So I want I want protein before I work out. I want carbs after I work out. And this is where a lot of people I think they 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 do this backwards. Reason being is basically it's it's um, carbs are telling my body to replenish. You no know, nobody's ever had a pancake breakfast and been like let's go kick butt and take names. Yeah. They eat, they want to go back to bed. You yeah. know you have an omelet in the morning. You're ready to rock and roll. Um, so I got to make sure a that you know post workout they're getting the right types of uh, the, the right amount of calories, the right type of calories. But then there's also, you know, I always talk about, you know, transporters. Um, they, you have to activate transporters. The body can only synthesize one gram of carbohydrate per minute. But if you use two transporters, you have, you have something called the s glute one and you have a glute five. You know, s glute one is a sodium-dependent transporter where glute five is, is more for fructose. So if I, if I combine dextrose, sodium, and fructose, my body can now synthesize 2.3 grams of carbohydrates per minute. And then the funny thing is if I add caffeine to that, I replenish, my replenishment goes up four times. I'll be four times faster. And, you know, for the average Joe, is that necessary? Maybe not. But uh, if, you're, if you're training twice a day, you know, at the level that you see people are, uh, yeah, that, that's going to make a huge difference. And uh, before before we go on, George, let them know the um, the uh, amounts that we're talking, like 40 grams of caffeine, 30 to 60 grams of carbs, things like that. Right, right. So, so the carbs, the carbs is always going to be a four to one ratio. And the way it, it sounds, it sounds kind of crazy, but like if you're uh, in intensity of 10, it's going to be like 80, 20, 80 percent carbs, 20 percent uh, protein. Um, and, and honestly, like the protein is not exactly necessary, but. Then you kind of the way it goes is like if it's a nine nine percent uh, I'm sorry nine intensity it'd be seventy two percent carbs and I think it's eighteen um, uh, protein and people are like well wait a minute that doesn't add up to a hundred because what happens is you start going down it's more fat that you're using and we don't want to refuel the fat you know what I'm saying <laughs> mm-hmm. so um, yeah so we and we keep it a four to one ratio in terms of carbs protein. Um, but like I said, post workout the uh, the the uh, the amount isn't too much. If you take BCAs, they've shown that if you take more than uh, I think 10 to 15 grams, you just basically kind of waste the money. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, means... what was your other question? I remember there's one more. No, that's good, man. Right there, actually, you kind of covered everything. Wait, what I got I... a question. Wait a minute. I I like a good pancake breakfast before workout. That's not good. <laughs> no, well, you know it's good if you enjoy a pancakes, but I mean, if you want to work out better, I... he enjoys everything. It's really not going to benefit him performance wise. So like... I can't have a, I can't have a like a post workout Pepsi that has caffeine. Uh... Right, right, dude. So, so here's 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 the thing, man. There's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a right or wrong in a lot of things. I always tell people there's a good and a better. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? There's so many common misconceptions out there nowadays, like uh, in terms of sugar. Now, so like I'll break things down Barney style, but like a Pepsi, does it have caffeine? Yes. Does it have sugar? Yes. Like this, your body can't tell. Like people are like, oh man, those are bad carbs. Or, These are good carbs. Your body cannot tell the difference between carbs. Once it comes down, once it hits your small intestinal tract, your body's got to break it down into a monosaccharide. Like it does not know. Like there's not like a good carb facility and a bad carb facility in your body. Um, but you talk about the rate in which your body's able to process it, you know what I'm saying, and how fast it's able to process it. You want stuff, you know, quick, fast, and in a hurry. And, you know, you start talking about acid and things like that. So carbonated, you know, carbonated Pepsi might not be the, the best mm. choice, Damn. but I will tell you it's better than nothing, man. It All really right, is. I like better that. Better than nothing. nothing. I'll take that. <laughs> you, you, you got sodium and sugar right there. You, you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, George. Uh, so there was a recent study done by the USC Performance Institute stated an athlete uh, has about 8% of water weight to lose before a total decrease in performance. Where would you like to see your fighters be at, ideally, come the final week before the fight? So let's say like seven days out or something like that. Man, typically I want them, uh, you know, I don't, go for, I don't go by percentages at all. And there's a reason for that. But it's uh, usually about 15 pounds. You know, about 15 pounds is where where I'm looking at. And um, <clears throat> the reason I, I, I do that, man, is, is a lot of people don't realize, like, you know, we want water coming from the muscles. You know, it's unfortunate, but, like, we want water coming from the muscles. Obviously, we don't want it coming from the organs and things like that. When you break down muscle, 
uh, a lot of people don't realize like how little muscle tissue you actually have. And when you look at numbers, let's say I get like a 170 and I get a 155 or so I let's say a 170 they have 10% body fat, which means they have 17 pounds of fat. And then you should, you know, basically subtract that from the overall weight. And, um, you, you multiply that by 40% because 40% of lean body mass is going to be a lean body tissue. Mm. All right. That lean body tissue, if you look at it between 155 and 145, I'm sorry, 155 and 170, dude, they're almost exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing, when you when you start dropping water weight, it's like, okay, how many grams of glycogen does each kilogram of muscle tissue hold? So each each kilogram of, of muscle tissue holds on to 13 grams of glycogen. And every gram of glycogen holds on to three grams of water. Seeing this, you can calculate, okay, this is how much weight this individual can lose. And, you know, it's funny because people are like, let's look at percentages. Percentages don't matter. Drew Dober, you know how much he lost? He lost 18% of his body weight. Wow. And Man. he went out and, dude, he knocked this guy out in, in the first round, two minutes and, in, in, uh, I think it was two minutes and 40 seconds. Gotcha. Um, so I would like to do white paper scissors. And, and here's, here's my big thing, man. Like, I, um, there's people out there that they, they, they're like, okay, this person's got to move up. And I love the intentions. You know, it's like, I, I love the intentions of these individuals because, you know, they're just trying to make the, the, the sport safer. Yeah. I've also heard the same people saying, we have to keep this a level playing field. Which, mm. at that point, I think that's BS. Because it's like, you go out, you find a good JITS coach, and you start beating everybody's ass at JITS. You know, you know, you know, wait a minute, hold on, we're, we got to keep this even. You know, like, there's no such thing. There's no even playing field. You know what I'm saying? You have rules. It's like these rules, you got to abide by these rules, and then and then from there on, like however you you, you uh, excel at it, you know you can't mm-hmm. try and take something away. And these, you know, like Drew Dover's never miss weight, never. Mm-hmm. And you know he's uh, he's going out there. He found he found professionals. He's like, okay, I need help with this. We went out, we helped him, and he had he has an extreme advantage. Do I want everybody to be like that? No, but if they want they want two things, they want him to either lose muscle mass or go up weight class. Mm-hmm. And I think in both instances, you're punishing a fighter that, that literally hasn't done anything wrong. So mm-hmm. I don't know where the 8% came from because, mm-hmm. you know, like 8% of the body body weight. If I have somebody that's, let's say, a 25% body fat yep. and, then, and 8%, man, 8% could be a lot. That could be a grip load because, like I said, fat doesn't hold water. Sure. Um, but then I get a guy that, you know, he shows up, he's 5% body fat. Dude, that, that dude could drop water like it's, it's going out of business, you know, yeah, if you do it sure. correctly. Listen, you're, you're, you're actually, I'm, I'm nodding my head in approval because I'm the strength coach. So gaining muscle to me <laughs> is awesome. And we've talked about this generally already. You know what I'm talking about, George. So, yeah, but, 100%. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But that's awesome. I, I like that you're actually telling people that muscle is not a bad thing for, for fighters to actually try to attain where, you know, you get a lot of fighters that and a lot of old school guys that are, are worried about gaining too much muscle and things like that. But people don't understand that it, it actually makes the weight cut easier. You know, you're, you're boosting metabolic rate with that same concept. So, yeah, I mean, why not? You know what I mean? But yeah. Oh no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. The more muscle you have, I mean, like, like you know, we were talking, you know, muscle eats calories faster than anything. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> these guys don't realize it's like, man, you, you know, you, this is one thing that I hate about weight cutting. Some people that they, uh, <clears throat> they're so worried about the weight that they, uh, they let the performance suffer. Their, their, their training camp is more about weight loss than it is about mm-hmm. improvement of performance. And, um, there's two things. Either, either at that point, you shouldn't be cutting weight. If you, like I would say, if you have a bad day of training and then you go home and you lost two pounds, you're like, yes, and you're happy. Yeah. Um, you're you're doing something wrong, man. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It should be all about the performance. Yeah, so. for sure. Um, some of the stuff you do for fighters as a nutrition coach is fascinating to me. You know, for example, uh, dropping off food to fighters, cooking meals, driving them to destinations, the apps a fighter can use during camp. It's like you are completely t- taking certain elements out of, uh, of, of a camp, out of a fighter's hands for their own good. Even from your own experience as a fighter, is there a big information lacking from fighters? And you mentioned it a little bit earlier on how to best take care of their bodies, you know, despite the fact that the body is what makes these, you know, brings these guys their income to, you know, do they not really understand it enough? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, you know that's, that's the biggest thing we have to get through is, the, you know, it's, it's, 
application of knowledge. You know what I mean? I think there's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff, and it's like, but how do we apply that? You know what I'm saying? You got some people that can talk about the mitochondria and the cells. Like, great, man. Like, how do I apply that with a weight cut? How do I apply that with this individual? And we also, you know, you always have like the human factor as well. You know, like each person is is different. You know, they have different quirks, behavior. You know, uh, a habit and stuff like that. But yeah, my my job is to go out there and try and educate these guys, man, and kind of be like, hey, look, this is this is what you think. This is what's been brought down, and that's something I've really realized that. Ah, you know, it sounds crazy. This is gonna sound like people are gonna well, what? The people that are hardest to work with, not always, but a lot of the time, is, is wrestlers. And the, re- the reason being is because the knowledge that's been passed down is very primitive in terms of weight cutting. You know, like. For wrestling, it's like, hey, put on the sauna suit, you know, cut the water, don't eat. And, you know, you'll see guys do this, you know, three, four days out from weigh-in. Um, and, dude, when you see the scale go down, like you put a sauna suit on, you'll see the scale go down. And it's like, well, yeah, this works. You know what I'm saying? But what they don't realize is that there's an end point to that. You know, like you do that for three days and you're killing your body. You're, you're basically soaking up your cells. Your, your, body's, your body's dying. Whereas with us, we have guys that are, they're staying hydrated and they kind of look at you like, man, is this way going to come off? And then yeah. all of a sudden it just drops. And that's why you call it a cut. You know what I mean? That's why yeah. it's called a cut. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of things like conceptions that if you break it down, Barney style, like here's one for you. If, uh, you know, one pound to lose one pound, I have to be at a deficit of 3,500 calories. Right. So to lose one pound, I got to be minus 3,500. To lose 10 pounds, that would be 35,000 calories that I'd have to be at a deficit. Number one, none of these guys are eating 3,500 calories a day, let alone being, I mean, being able to be at a deficit of 3,500 calories. So you're telling me if they went, they went uh, a whole week without eating any, any food, they still wouldn't drop to 10 pounds. So it's not a calorie thing. Once you show up fight week, it's not about calories. I actually increase calories the week of the fight. reason being is because – it's not calories that's going to, that you're losing. It's all water weight. So if I if I cut that, it's like basically calories is a measurement. It's a measurement of heat, but it's also a measurement of energy, right? So it's basically energy that I'm giving you. So I'm like, okay, this individual is going to cut water. They need to get rid of water. They have to have energy to cut the water. Mm. But fighters, <laughs> the mm. fighters, they cut the energy. They cut the they cut the energy. And they're like, man, I feel like crap. I can't even go get a good sweat. You're like, mm-hmm. you kind of see the problem here, buddy? Like, you, you check them. Um, we, we give them numbers, man. They, they're like, dude, that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's something that we need, um, you know, in the sport. And that's, you know, like I said, that's why one of my goals is. Uh, this year we're going after Bellator, too. So right. hopefully yeah. by the end of, yeah, by the end of the year we'll be, we'll be part of Bellator in, uh, in a big way. Nice, man. I mean, to add to the, you know, the point of maybe fighters not being more aware, I mean, you have the, you know, you worked with John Jones and he has his situation going on with his PED, you know, positive tests and everything. I mean, does it baffle you sometimes that you have so many fighters who are great athletes and they'll have this, I don't know how that got in my system excuse. Like, how do you, would you have any suggestions how to better inform fighters? You know, like they have these combines and other sports and they have these, these seminars i know they have the ufc thing seminar but would do you have any ideas is it just as simple as getting in contact with better people coaches nutritionists like yourself that have the information to inform them like how how do we get fighters because we've had so many guests on our shows that the fighters will just lack professionalism and take care of their bodies i mean what would your best suggestions be for a fighter to stay out of trouble and be the best you know prepared and knowledgeable fighter they can be Right. No, I, you, you hit the nail on the head. You need to get somebody that is specialized in it. You know, um, we haven't worked with John since we started working with Daniel Cormier, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the big thing is, is, is we, when we work with, we work with people, we, you don't put anything in your mouth. You know what I'm saying? Unless it's got a third party stamp and we're like, hey, man, you know, and there's certain supplement companies that we go to. You know, we go to, you know, obviously on it, they sponsor us and uh, everything's third party certified. All Max, everything's third party certified. Um, and that's huge. And a lot of people don't actually understand that. You know, they, they go in there like, you hey, said to get BCAs, this, this says BCAs, but third party just basically states that this is, there's somebody outside of our company that is checked to make sure that we said that everything and only what we say is in here. Um, it's, it's very important. And, you know, one thing I always tell people, especially in the UFC is, you know, 
if you uh, if you you know you got these guys that are knockout artists, right? They've never been submitted because they've been knocking everybody out. That doesn't mean you don't work on your jits. You know what I'm saying? It's sad because they it's, they they let's say some of them they don't work on that jits until they get submitted, and then they're like crap, I get a jits coach. Yeah. Same thing. You got guys that are great wrestlers, they able to submit everybody, and then they get knocked out. Now now they can find a striking coach. Um, the unfortunate thing is a lot of guys we get calls from, they had a horrible weight cut and it affected them. And the thing is, is in this sport, you lose one fight to, to, to whatever, a bad weight cut, to jits, whatever. It throws you back three fights. You know what I mean? It, it's going to take you three more fights to get back to where you were, you know? Um, basically, like, in rankings and things uh, things of that nature, you know, like, you know, why risk it? Stay ahead of the game, you know what I mean? And, um and God, you know, God forbid you, you get popped for, uh, you know, a tennis element. I think that there are a lot of guys that have actually taken the stuff out there. They didn't know, you know. Um, and that stigma, um, it stays with you. And it sucks. It's going to be, on your, you know, people are going to be like, oh, that guy popped. You know what I mean? And some of the stuff that some people have popped for, I think it was uh, Leota Machida popped a while back. Yeah. Dude, what he popped for, man? I mean, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, like people are like, he's on steroids. And they're like, yeah. okay, well. Um, but, you know, so it, 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 it sucks. But, you know, I think in terms of your career, your reputation, it just behooves you. And, and the thing is, like, and this isn't me selling stuff, but we, we really don't charge. Like, we, we charge you know, for people that, uh, like do a fight camp, it's um, on just online. It's like three hundred fifty bucks, you know. And you you'll be able to talk to one of our specialists. Obviously, like you want me or or the team to go out there, it, you know, it's more. But you know, we make we make it work for everybody, man. And that's and that's what we do. That's what we want to do. That's awesome, man. So talking about the you know the week of the fight for the final week of the fight, knowing that this could be subjective to the individual, but what would you like to feed your athletes consuming? Like, what would you, what would you have them consuming for the, for the overall perspective of that week? I know you, I know you go, I mean, I've been with you now. I know you worked with Dustin Poirier. Now we're working with Joanna. What do you like to feed them, you know, come fight week? Man. Um, it, it pancakes. Blows a lot. <laughs> Do pancakes, damn <laughs> it! I, I can't even freaking pancakes. pancakes <laughs> no, man. Dude, honestly, like when people see it, like uh, I, you know, I'll do like a lot of. Um, I keep the, obviously the biggest thing the week of the fight is sodium, 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 sodium. Because nice. you know as well as I do in terms of like working out, you can burn up your your body stores of carbs like very quickly. So there's no reason to basically cut back on the carbohydrates. The type of carbohydrates I will cut back on. Uh, I do a lot more fruits. Um, than, than, uh, than a lot of people. Um, but like, for instance, this week, uh, I was giving people like, uh, I made a seared, uh, you tuna, nice. um, I'm a big fan of like snappies and stuff like that. Like the, the dry snap, they're like chips. And the funny thing is like when you, when you bite something crunchy, it actually helps you feel, uh, more satiated, you know? Oh. Um, and it depends on each person the, the, the big things are like protein, obviously will make you uh, feel satiated, but, um, you know, we uh, we want to give carbs when we need to give carbs. So, like, we say everybody's different. So, if I have somebody like Frankie, Frankie doesn't, like, he doesn't sauna. He doesn't, you know, he, he works off his weight. You know, he, he likes to work it off. So, I'm going to be giving him a lot more carbohydrates sure. yeah. uh, up until, you know, up until that last workout where it's like, okay, well, the water's gone from the sweat. Now, we're going to take all the glycogen out. And then we won't reload him until, obviously, after he, he makes weight. Mm-hmm. Whereas... And it's funny, man, because you got guys 145 down, they all want to work the weight off. Mm. You get guys 155 up, they're like, dude, I just want to do nothing. Like, I will sit yeah. in the sauna, <laughs> I will sit in the bath. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I was the same way, man. When I was fighting, I was like, screw that. I, I'll do, like, a little workout. But, I, ain't, you know, I've seen, I seen some of these guys grinding. I'm like, damn. Like, yeah, yeah. I barely... Fighting. I barely ever wanted to do anything, man. So I just <laughs> sit in the sauna. That's about it. Maybe sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, man. That is that's a hundred percent. That's it, um, man. I, I, you know, it's funny because you, you asked me, and I'm like trying to like I'm almost wanting to look on my Instagram because like I, I put them all on my Instagram and stuff. But uh, oh. yeah, you know, I do uh, like a lot of uh, lean meats, lean chicken. I actually make pork chops uh, this this last uh, this last week. 
Yeah, dude. I'm making some like it up, butter. Man. Like it sucks because I can't, oh. I can't salt it or anything. But yeah. Yeah. bro, this this guy, wow. if you check his Instagram, he's got plates, man. Oh, like nice. four <laughs> like plates, man. I'm like, damn. All right. <laughs> <laughs> dude, that's and look, you know that's all basically fight week. Those those are that's what you'll be eating on fight week, man. Um, so JJ so cool, has some man. pork yeah. chops to look forward to in fight week. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, dude. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with her, man. Seeing, uh, you know, she'll, uh, she'll probably get some. We'll, we'll see what she likes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll be there personally for her. We, we also, we, we have Khabib on that fight, and oh, no. I think we'll have Kiesa. And we have a lot. But so in essence, we'll probably bring the whole team so I can work specifically with Joanna, and then uh, I think Tyler Men's working specifically with Khabib, and then, um, and then we got the rest of the team working with everybody else on the card. Nice. Uh, when Phil yeah. told me about you were coming on to be a guest, of course, he was very complimentary of your reputation, the interaction you've had with him directly. Uh, he also mentioned how you are not a guy looking for the spotlight moments with your fighters at press events. You you know, you look kind of like an assassin. You get in, you do your job, you get out even before the fight sometimes. And I really respected that because there's some coaches that like to be in the spotlight and they, you know, draw from their, their fighters. What is it that makes you prefer to be more low-key and in the shadows in that fight night lead-up and week lead up? <laughs> Well, man, you know, it's funny because everybody, like, everybody makes jokes at the UFC. They're like, hey, Lockhart, you going to fight tonight? No, they're like, oh, of course not, right? I, <laughs> as soon as the weigh-ins are done, man, I, I literally, like, I go to the weigh-ins, and then my bags are packed. I'm, I'm like, walking out the door after the weigh-ins, like, all right, peace, see you guys later. I'm going home to see my son. Uh-huh. Um, and, dude, also, I'm like, man, I, uh, I I like to stay in my lane. Um, I'm the food guy, you know? I'm the food dude. That's yeah. That's what it is, you know? And I love talking about what I do. I'm very passionate about it. I love I love the fighters. But, you know, at the end of the day, man, they're the ones in the cage. They're the ones, you, you know what I mean? They're the warriors. And, uh, I, you know, I am, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I just don't, I can't see me trying to jump in the spotlight because I cook some food for somebody. But, uh, <laughs> you know, teach their own. <laughs> I hear you, man. I mean, of course. Hey, you're... listen, my, 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 my job's pretty much over. Well, one week to two weeks out from the fight, so I, I hear you on that one, bro. Right, right. Dude, you know, I got yeah. All the spotlight I need is when they win. You know what I mean? I, yeah. They feel good, and they're just like, thanks, man. So, yeah, you know, I wouldn't say that's the best business model. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, you're doing you well, know? so it's not a bad business model. No, no, I, I think you know. At, at the end of the day, man, like it's one thing that we learned in the Marine Corps is like. If you're good, you don't have to talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, Bill Gates doesn't say he's rich because everybody knows it, you know? Yeah. And um, if I have to talk about it that much, I'm probably not that good. Nice. So that's it, man. I mean, of, of course, you're a very busy man with your work, but what are your passions away from the sport of MMA and fighting? Like, like what do you do? like to do for fun? And what kind of things are you into? Movies, music, all that kind of stuff. Oh, bro, dude, I'm a movie fan. So, okay, so yes. there's two things that I love in this world. There's my wife and my son. Like, you know, you know, like, that, like that's, it, you know, they uh, they always say, like, you know, you can you can you can choose you can, you can find where a man's heart is by where his treasure lies. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, you know, people are like, well, you know, I care about this, I care about this, but if you look at the bank account, it doesn't really show that's what you care about. If you look at the bank account, it's like either. Toys R Us, or you know, <laughs> or a freaking dinner reservation, or something. Yeah, you know? man. So, I love, I love it, man. I love, uh, I love hanging out with the wife, with my son, me and him. But we literally, right before uh, I got on this interview, while well, we they were watching the show Max Steel, like he, I don't know, he just loves that show. So we sit there <laughs> and we play uh, these little video games. Like I've never been a damn gamer, but like I catch myself like, give it to me, give it to me, get away from that guy. You know what I mean? Like I'm so into it because I know he wants yeah. to get to the next level. Mm. Um, but yeah, man, that's about it, bro. I'm kind of a, <laughs> mm. I guess I'm kind of boring. Well, you said nah, you're a movie bro. fan. Do we have a George Lockhart Oscar pick since the Oscars are tonight? Oh man, dude, like my movies, movies that I like. Yeah. Oh, you typical, man. You got it. I mean, this is so like, uh, okay. Of course, this is every dude's favorite movie, but like, yeah, Braveheart, Gladiator, Troy, <laughs> Last of the you know oh, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like, but I will, I will. Dude, I will tell you this. Me and my wife, like, I'm a fucking chick flick fanatic. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, <laughs> I do. I like a foot, like, a, like, or, like more like a rom com. Like anything with like Matthew McConaughey and fucking Kate Hudson. I'm gonna, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, bro. 
The Marine yeah. like chick flicks, bro. I Have love you seen it. Black Dude, right? No, I haven't, man. I was going to take my son. I have not seen it. I've heard so many good things about it. Oh, it's fantastic. You got to see Are you into the Marvel movies in general? Oh, hell yeah. Yes. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. See, man, you got to watch that <laughs> oh my shit. God. It's good. Now, J- Jason is now your biggest fan, bro. That's it. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> He's like, you done fucked up now, dog. It's a wrap now, dog. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, dude, I, uh, you like movies, but what about like like shows? Like you know what I'm saying? Like, like Netflix, things oh, like that. What are we talking dude, about? Dude, I'm dude. I'm gonna sound like such a loser. Yeah, fuck, dude. I watch so many damn. Shows. Now here's the thing. This is, I don't know what it is with with uh, a lot of women that you know that, that I, I've noticed like in relationships. I talk. I you know you see people and uh, you talk to them like, yeah, my wife too. Like my wife loves like reality shit, like CSI and Criminal Minds and, and Law and Order. I'm like, dude. I'm like, that's like watching real life. Like, I watch TV to get away from real life. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <So>. yeah. <laughs> oh, you man. Love those like, uh, how I met you. Oh, God, dude. I, 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 got, I was raised, my dad would watch them. And now, now my wife watches them. I'm like, good Lord. I can't hear that. Don't, don't. <laughs> any, anymore for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. <laughs> well, but, I didn't get the answer I was looking for. Jason, tell him why I'm I'm looking for this answer. I'll Go be ahead, looking for him. Vikings. Yes. That's oh, fuck show. yeah, dude. Dude. That's my oh, show. no. <laughs> dude. Oh, my. Dude. I'm telling you, Vikings and fucking. Have you, have you, have you ever seen Spartacus? Of course, man. Of course. Oh, okay. I was just making sure. Dude, that's. Favorite shows, God Honest Truth, favorite. Like, me and my wife have watched Spartacus, like, mm-hmm. they were going, like, three times. And my wife fucking loves Spartacus, you That's know what nice. I mean? What about Game there of Thrones? Yeah. Dude, okay, so I'm behind on Game of Thrones. But I you watched, know like, it's the good, first though. Season. Oh, I did, I did. Problem is, like, it, it took too long to get going from, like, my, my wife. So you know how it is, man. Like, if we're going to watch shows, my wife yeah. likes it. We like it. I can binge watch that. Yeah. yeah. If not, so I can do it on my say? own. <laughs> would you say what's better, Game of Thrones or Vikings? It's going to be Vikings. Oh, Vikings. Oh, yeah. my yes, God. Vikings. Yeah. Get, what the hell? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> See? It's a wrap, Jason. Oh, dude. We already won. Bro, yeah. Dude, yeah. Vikings, yeah, man. That's gangster. Oh, Fucking right, Boy, man. Right. I, see, <laughs> I, I knew I like George. See, I told you. <laughs> All right, I mean, so you know. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, is there anything you want to let people know if they're not following you yet in terms of social media, the the Instagram, the Twitter, Facebook, any websites that, I mean, Fitness VT, of course. Uh, I'm not going to say Snapchat because it seems like everybody, like like Phil, hates Snapchat now after the updates, but anything Thank people God. can follow. Yeah, Phil, bro, I'm with you on that one. <laughs> uh, dude, yeah, you, know, you can follow me on uh, Lock Loaded MMA. You have uh, Lockhart and Leaf is, is on there. See with me and my partner. He's out there working with Demi Lovato right now. Oh, you know, it's funny we get a lot of uh, you know flag for for fighting, but we work out outside of the fight realm a lot. Man, I work with a lot of celebrities and things like that. Um, and then our website, man. If you go to www.lockhardandleaf.com, we have a DVD set coming out. You know, it basically shows the entire system, our own nutrition. We'll be having a cookbook coming out. So uh, follow us, man. And you know, we're actually looking for people that, uh, you know, that, that want to get into this and uh, kind of work for us. So they can DM me anytime and uh, we'll get back to you. All right, Phil, you know the social uh, information as always. Yeah, uh, Twitter and Instagram is at Daru Strong. And you can check me out on my website, www.darustrong.com. Real simple, real easy. Thank you, George, for coming on. I really appreciate it, man. I'll be, you know, you know, I'll be hitting you up here and there once in a while. So it's all Absolutely, good. Absolutely, man. Look forward to it, brother. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, as always, remember, you can find us, Fight Strength Podcast, on Facebook at Fight Strength underscore. Uh, Check us out, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes. This episode, as always, will be on our night at 9.30 Monday morning. And uh, again, George Lockhart, thank you so much. Phil DeRue, I am Jason Burgos. This is episode 32. Bye-bye.